a special presentation of LOBF with archaeologist <coughs> Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, and along with my host, Dr. Larry Garrity, a uh, longtime archaeologist, uh, former president of La Sierra University, continuing to contribute in lots of ways to the university. And we have invited as a guest Dr. Kent Bramlett, assistant professor of archaeology and the history of antiquity at La Sierra University, to talk about the ancient rose red city of Petra, mm -hmm. part three, uh, the Roman period. Uh, so we think about Petra. Everybody has heard about Petra. It's one of the seven wonders recently voted uh, right. of the world. What does Petra mean to you? Uh, just quickly, either a story, an account, or some part of Petra. What does it mean to you? Well, I first visited Petra uh, it's just over 60 years ago when I was a teenager. And uh, my parents uh, were driving a Studebaker down the King's Highway before it was paved, and my job when my dad would stop with a big stone and a rock in the road was to get out and move the, the rock so that we could proceed. And it was before the days of any hotels, so we stayed in a tent camp uh, inside. Uh, and so I have, when, whenever I go to Petra, I think of that original mm -hmm. visit and how exciting it was to go through the Seek and mm -hmm. see the monuments. To, to go through that crevice and, right. and to arrive at the treasury right, and right. to see Petra right, from the inside. Right, but yeah. done so as, a, how old were you then? I was 13. As, as a child, yeah. I was mm -hmm. a teenager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kent. Well, I think it's the ambiance. One can visit ruins in many places of the world, but it's, true. it's and an experience you have. of going. <laughs> You've been yeah. to uh, the mall, I think. Quite a, quite a few. <laughs> but it's that experience of going through that narrow passageway, mm -hmm. and then suddenly there's these monuments carved out yeah. of the rock. Yeah. It's yeah. very unusual, and, and just it's isolated too, up in the mountains mm -hmm. of Eden. Right. And, and very I think uh, that for me, the, my first visit was to stay overnight in the treasury in El Kazna wow. <laughs> uh, late on a Friday evening with some friends and it was it was terrific and then to wake up to this rose red city what half mm -hmm. as old as time I think right. is how <laughs> Bird, yeah. uh, puts it um, we are going to be talking in this edition of uh, excavating the Bible about the Roman period mm -hmm. first of all before we actually get into that what what do we need to know about the Romans and about the expanse of the mm -hmm. Roman Empire, about the time frame? This, I think, will give us a little bit of context for mm -hmm. understanding Petra in the Roman period. Mm -hmm. Rome is unusual. To be a Roman originally meant to be a citizen of one small city, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, part of Italy now. <laughs> and as Rome became more powerful, the provinces, uh, regions around Rome, which was now conquered by Rome, wanted to be has a citizenship uh, status within the empire. So actually, the the rules changed, and eventually, Rome allowed that. And then, as the empire increased, more and more people were part of this. So that while many people in the Roman Empire weren't Roman, somebody like Paul, mm -hmm. born in Tarsus in what's now Turkey, could be a Roman citizen. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they were inclusive, but it was still a, uh, a step up the ladder, mm -hmm. quite a high step. And it was a true empire, wasn't it? I mean, all the way from Britain to Saudi Arabia, you yeah. have under one government all these people. And North Africa. And North Africa, and right, right. right. So mm -hmm. you said something about being a Roman or being mm -hmm. a Roman citizen. Uh, there's a sense in which we think about these empires, these colonial empires that are moving and capturing mm -hmm. territory and peoples. Who are the Romans in these places? I mean. Mm -hmm they were the locals who were there, right? I Many mean, times, especially uh, in the eastern part of the empire, these were right. Greek-speaking natives of the eastern mm -hmm. part. And mm -hmm. They so, worked so, for the so, Roman administration. So we can't think about dis people being displaced. I mean, that mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not primarily what's happening here. You've got the people who now become part of the empire. Part of that and identity. In their, in their citiz citizenship. And their Usually own. their governor was probably... Probably Latin-speaking from, from, from the West. From Rome, right. And some of the uh, s soldiers, at least the ones who were in charge of the uh, regiment that was there. But many of the soldiers' tombs, the lower levels, they're all written in Greek. That's true. We know they're mm -hmm. from, from the 
at least. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? mm -hmm. And so time period. Um, you talked about geography, Larry. Mm -hmm. What about time mm -hmm. period for the Roman Empire? When, when do we feel the impulse of the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean world, in the Eastern Mediterranean world? I think we talk about the first century uh, BC. And yeah, uh, 63 mm -hmm. with the movement of Pompey to settle the dispute over who should be the next <laughs> Jewish ruler of the Hasmonean kingdom. That's right. right, in Israel. Yeah. Right. 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 right, yeah. Of course, yeah. the Romans settled that dispute and stayed. And stayed, and right. The Romans <laughs> to help you settle a dispute, they will help you leave. <laughs> and it probably goes down to, in, in our part of the world, the fourth century, and it's just, mm. it takes, uh, the, the, the new Rome takes over with the Byzantines, you know, right. but it's right. a pretty even transition. And that transition happens in the 320s, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then we have what we call the Byzantine period. We'll talk about that on another mm -hmm. episode. Mm -hmm. And what we have in Petra from that time mm -hmm. period. So if we look at Petra itself then, uh, and as we go, first of all, uh, from a satellite map, and then we'll look at the chronology, um, the wide area. This is all in southern Jordan. Um, what would be, if we were farther north, the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. This is the Arabah. So this deep rift that extends how far into Africa, Kent? Oh my God! Yeah, now, were you you were there, I think, recently? <laughs> the summer, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, through Kenya, Tanzania, yeah. on so, down, actually as far as Mozambique. Right. So as significant as the rift is here, it's huge, and it keeps going north and south beyond. Goes it. all the way to Turkey, doesn't it? From Victoria, Lake Victoria, down in the right. in Africa, clear up to Turkey. Mm. And then one gets up to the mountainous country here. Uh, in Petra, one approaches Petra from Wadi Musa, the modern village, the spring or the riverbed of mm -hmm. Moses, um, and then the Petra proper here. Um, um Sehun is the modern village where the Badul Bedouin had been uh, mm -hmm. settled, coming out of Petra. We'll talk about that in the future. <coughs> and then Beda here, the, the, the Neolithic period um, site. So we have chronologically all the way back to a few millennia BC up to actually to modern times. Um, some gaps, but uh, we should expect that. And the fact that Wadi Musa has that name means that their supposedly biblical connections are to connections right. between this right. area and Bible characters. Right. And we could even think about places like Jebel Harun, the mountain of Aaron mm -hmm. in connection with the Moses story. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So we have, and, and I mean, these are early traditions. Right. And right. Uh, they've, they've, they've shaped Petra mm -hmm. and its ambiance mm -hmm. and its significance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, to people who, who re revere and respect these right. individuals. Not only in the Bible, but also in the Quran. Right. Those, mm -hmm. those <laughs> names have transitioned and maintained through changes right. of, of empires as well as religions. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at the Roman occupation, Petra has occupation back to the Neolithic period. You've got uh, some dates along the side. Some of these are estimates, but uh, down to the modern period. And we'll talk about that in a future edition of this program. But the Roman occupation squeezed in here. And if you'll notice that most of these dates, you get down here and you get specific dates, but most of these dates are, are centuries or millennia. But this one, the Roman one, begins 106. <laughs> right. I think most people would argue that the Romans and the Nabataeans who preceded them actually collaborated in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. But 106 marks, I don't know if you can call it a conquest by the Romans or a uh, kind of a, a pushing in and taking over from the mm -hmm. Nabataeans in mm -hmm. one way or another, uh, but 106. So what happened in 106 and why that date? Well, we have the story, of course, uh, in the Roman uh, histories, and uh, the Nabataeans were very proud of their independence, and they were in an isolated region that was hard to get to, and they never imagined that uh, an enemy would come from that deep rift valley that, that you showed at the beginning. And uh, the Roman uh, armies went through that rift valley and came up from the west, which nobody had ever done, and captured the city uh, while, as, while they were expecting people to come from the east, but right. the Romans came from the west, a very unusual situation. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that they had gone along for as long as they did. 
The Romans, I think, had been preoccupied with trying to subdue the Euphrates and Tigris valleys mm -hmm. as an access to the east. Mm -hmm. And the Nabataeans had these trade routes going across Arabia to bring the incense and the spices from, mm -hmm. well, from Yemen, from mm -hmm. Somalia, the Horn mm -hmm. of Africa. Um, but the Romans always had their eyes on this eastward expansion, but it was too troublesome. But then as they began to go around the Nabataeans by ship, as, as they established the Red Sea bases, uh -huh. suddenly the Nabataeans could see the, the writing on the wall. And uh, the Romans had a new, I think, confidence that they could take them on. Right, right. And the, it just irritated the Romans if they weren't in charge, right? Yeah. They yeah. didn't want any little pockets <laughs> that right. were independent. They had Lots of revenue. That, that's right. The yeah, right. Yeah. Well, that would be part of the expansion. And so as we look now at another satellite map, um, what is identified in these uh, red boxes are the major Roman remains. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that's not on here that we'll visit, and so I'll say something about that. But when we will look at the Roman theater, here is one where one comes into Petra uh, through the Seek, this crevice, this uh, rock uh, canyon. And here is where the treasury is, the kind of the famous Indiana Jones uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. temple, mm -hmm. uh, which is, we don't think was, well, we're not sure what it was, but uh, it, it didn't, it's nothing like in the movie. I mean, we're not talking <laughs> about the same thing. But that's where that is. And the, the Roman theater is here. The colonnaded street is here with a triumphal arch at the, uh, at the western end, uh, the main cardo, the main street. Mm -hmm. We'll come back and, and talk about that. Uh, a couple of major Roman uh, installations here, the Great Temple, a garden and pool complex. We'll come back and look at those. The Temple of the Winged Lion, and then the, the Kasser or the castle of the daughter of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. um, traditions go back, which are quite unsupportable, mm -hmm. um, to an Egyptian pharaoh here, um, and built before um, the Romans, but we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that too. And then there's another place that we'll be stopping in, these, in some of the photos. It's right down in here where the famous tomb of the Roman soldier mm -hmm. uh, is located mm -hmm. and some Roman structures, so mm -hmm. um, we'll have a chance to do that. Theaters. <laughs> Why are the Romans so anxious if they're going to build a city to have a theater in it? What, what, what was the issue about this? Because you go to any major Roman city mm. and they have the theater. What, what, what is this about the Romans? And yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> these theaters have started, you know, of course, with the Greeks, who, uh, for the Greeks, they were associated with, with temples and mm -hmm. worship originally, mm -hmm. and then with plays. But the Romans, it was all about uh, gladiatorial entertainment and exhibition of, of strength mm -hmm. and com com uh, competitions. Right, right. It was the place where the government could reach the people if they wanted a major announcement or, uh, you know, that sort of thing. They could always come there. And it seems to be a marker. We're a city when we've got right, right. a theater. It somehow it has to be tied into something like right. Some people have, have spoken of the furniture of a Roman uh -huh. city. You have to have a theater, a colonnaded street, and Roman baths uh -huh. and things, and the theaters are right. always there. Right. Right. Well, this is a terrific theater, although it's not used um, partly because of the danger of the rocks around it, and say that, so they don't. There are lots of Roman theaters in the Middle East, I think of several mm -hmm. in Jordan, that are used on a mm -hmm. regular basis, mm -hmm. and in Israel too, um, for programs. Um, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 people, they, mm -hmm. some of these can accommodate. And I think, I think they say that about 6,000 people could be accommodated at this one. The, the amazing thing about this that makes it different, as we can see, is that it's cut out of the rock. Uh, most theaters, of course, are built on a hillside uh, with, with stones that are cut from a quarry and arranged. But here, all they had to do was just uh, cut the, the uh, rows of seats in place. Right, right. The, the, the Romans, at least there's some very simplistic line about the Romans and their architecture that the Nabataeans tended to dig in the rock Romans tended to build with rock and right. to build up. But this is certainly something cut into mm -hmm. rock. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything Nabataean here before the Roman theater, do we? I don't think so. I'm not aware mm -hmm. of that. And so here they are um, mm -hmm. um, digging the rock out. Now, here's the place that uh, did not show up on the map, but I indicated mm -hmm. in that valley, actually right past the Nabataean high place. Mm -hmm. And it come down the back side, the western side. Mm -hmm. And there is a pathway, and it comes through several things including what are called triclinia. What is a triclinium, singular? What did they use Well, it's a, a place for eating, a, a formal dining room. 
try, think mm -hmm. of three, mm -hmm. and then recline, we have an English word to lie down. It's, it's the typical Roman uh, position for eating, leaning down on one shoulder and having a low table. Mm -hmm. Servants could come, <coughs> like the horseshoe only was squared off, servants could come from the inside and mm -hmm. serve everybody right. at the back. Right. And, and we have those light, low tables there in the we bottom of do. the slide. So, so here's so. where mm -hmm. uh, one of the tables comes out, it's open in the middle, and then here's another table. And so people could <coughs> recline behind and be right. served from the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Very efficient. And for the elite? Is this, yes, uh, this is not uh, everybody's table? Actually, this was not originally a Roman tradition, and some of the old timers actually bemoaned the sort of the frivolous uh, developments <laughs> within Roman culture, and they considered this one of them. Uh, interesting, very interesting. And you can see where the statues would be <laughs> there. They've the disappeared the now. Niches. Right, right. But is, isn't the, uh, the rock beautiful, this, these uh, mm -hmm. layers? Of, it is, uh, and, and we there. would have left it this way. Mm -hmm. Larry, if you and I had designed <laughs> That's this, right. we would have left this way, but the Romans did not. No. Um, you can actually see the pick marks um, from uh, iron Plaster. picks. Mm -hmm to put the plaster, to make sure that the plaster would attach. Mm -hmm. And then they would paint the plaster. Mm -hmm. um, some of it might have been uh, impregnated, uh, the plaster, when it was wet. Um, but in any case, um, all of this is covered up. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Such a shame. Yeah. Uh, well, as we think about uh, right. the beauty of the stone. There's another picture uh, in the same place. And then looking across, outside of the triclinium, uh, across, to, the across this pathway, mm -hmm to the Roman uh, tomb of the Roman soldier. It's spectacular inside. I mean, it's just a huge block opening. Um, but it comes from the Roman period and uh, represents some military activity here. And part of the statuary you can see still in those niches. Correct. Yeah. Um, in the, the niches mm -hmm. above the doorway. Mm -hmm. Correct. OK, <laughs> Roman cities, the furniture Roman, of a Roman city. Yeah, we're gonna have to have a road. And look how nicely crested it is for the water to run off to the sides. And yeah. you have uh, drainage channels also underneath, usually a large sewer going underneath with manholes going down mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. You have sidewalks on the side. And then beyond that, the colonnades and the room for the shops. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's so very carefully laid out. So we would see shops along the side. Mm -hmm. um, called the cardo, right? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, 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 the heart. heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is looking to the west, and it might be interesting to orient ourselves now that we're on the ground. Um, on the left-hand side over here is going to be the pool and garden, and then the um, temple, the great temple. Casar mm -hmm. uh, al Bent is down there. There is an archway here, but we can't see it now. We will soon. Um, that was the triumphal arch um, when this was laid down, and we'll talk about the date in a minute. Um, and then over here, we can't really see them too well, are the remains of the Temple of the Winged Lion. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll be visiting uh, those places. And the stream places. that may have created that seek or that uh, narrow defile in the <coughs> city it continues on through the uh, center of the city, doesn't it, over to the right of the road right, there. You can right, just right. see where the stream was. This was built in 106, mm -hmm. and that conquest that we talked about before. And I think I've told you the story about um, finding at Heshbon. Uh -huh. uh, Larry and I spent a lot of years <laughs> at Heshbon, um, finding a coin um, in fill. It was just dirt that had been used to fill something, to level something. Mm -hmm. A coin, Roman coin, and it was one of the commemorative coins, 106 AD, mm -hmm. uh, for the conquest of Petra. Mm -hmm. That was exciting. Yeah, uh, when you connect that to the historical period. Mm -hmm. So that was known far and wide. Mm -hmm. uh, the Romans were not shy about PR mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. letting people know what they did. We can think in our own history, can't we, of certain dates that we commemorate. Uh, we would do it on coins or on postage right. stamps and right. so on. And as you say, this was something that Romans were particularly proud of. Right. And now we're looking the other direction. We were looking west. Now we're looking uh, to the east. And these are Nabataean tombs. Actually, the Romans used some of the tombs up mm -hmm. here, too, mm -hmm. uh, in some of the royal ones. So. Uh, again, part of the Romans, and these columns would have lined the streetway, I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. all the way along, and then be all kinds of things behind it. And then the triumphal arch uh, at the western end, mm -hmm. um, again, put up there to celebrate the conquest, the Roman conquest. Uh, mm -hmm. The Romans were about 
conquest and about uh, gathering and gaining and controlling. Mm -hmm. And they displayed this. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly. And they're famous for their laws, too. They're very well organized, weren't they, with a set of laws that uh, sort of kept everybody in line. Right. Okay, the Temple of the Winged Lion on the north side of that cardo, of that street. Here is one of the reasons it's called that. Um, a lion here, and the lion's head, of course, uh, and then the wing, mm -hmm. which what? Suggests what, Kent, from the ancient world? What, well, these winged beasts, what, what does that suggest? Um, well, speed of movement, ability to oftentimes protect. Mm -hmm. Think of the sculptures which protected the Assyrian palaces, again with wings, right. um, guardian entities. Mm -hmm. When we read Daniel, we, we read about these winged uh, animals, don't we, right. and the dreams that he had. Right. Well, yeah. and when you read Ezekiel, mm -hmm. the winged animals in the first part of Ezekiel are cherubs. Mm -hmm. So we think of cherubs as, and cherubim mm -hmm. as human angelic figures. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least in Ezekiel, um, mm -hmm. we're talking 6th century BC, mm -hmm. uh, in Ezekiel they are um, winged lion. Um, in fact, you have, you have lion face, you have the eagle, you've mm -hmm. got the wings, you've got the uh, oxen uh, hooves and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So these are composites, these are animal composites mm -hmm. with the ability to move so, readily. Right, mm -hmm. so the idea of a mobility is important both uh, from a civil standpoint and from the religious standpoint right, of right. the deities. So connected with deity and royalty. Mm -hmm. I mean, King Solomon had what <laughs> alongside his throne? I mean, there were these, these lion mm -hmm. figures. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. um, we've got this kind of connection that was significant. Philip uh, Hammond excavated this, didn't he? He came from the University of Utah, and he mm -hmm. was there for many years. But um, then it uh, lay uh, uh, collecting uh, <laughs> dust from storms <laughs> and so on for a long time. And then friends of ours have more recently re-excavated and they're consolidating it from the American schools of oriental research. So it looks uh, so much better now and one's able to visit it and uh, see what it's like. And it is the American Center in Jordan um, that was able to get a grant. I mean, right. this, is, this is State Department funds. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. to help uh, build up the um, cultural resources mm -hmm. of these countries. Mm -hmm. And I think the first grant was $600,000 mm -hmm. to consolidate. Mm -hmm. So they've taken it seriously mm -hmm. and they're working on it and mm -hmm. this too will be uh, ready for the world to view and mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. um, very much so. Kasser El Bint, now Larry, you talked about um, your first stay right. in a tent, um, kind of a, it wasn't a caravanserai, but no. it was a, a, a kind of a, a It had been set up for tourists. And yeah. that was Nazal's camp, Nazal's right? camp. And Nazal's camp actually was uh, right, right there. over That's here, right. wasn't it? We were right under that large tree that was you there. Remember that I, tree I remember that tree, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Kasser el Bint, right. the, the castle of the daughter of Pharaoh. Um, and it's interesting that that's the only surviving building in the whole valley that has not collapsed Intended, through the right. years. Partially right. collapsed. But Partially right. collapsed, but right. what you're seeing there is most was mostly there. A little, little bit of it's been restored, right. but most of that has remained through the years. Right. And I think that we have an artist, uh, actually an architect, um, Kanalopoulos from Greece, um, an attempt to describe this. He was part of the team mm -hmm. uh, that, mm -hmm. that worked for a long time in, in Petra mm -hmm. and so has uh, provided this uh, artistic rendition, uh, a very important thing. Probably Nabataean mm -hmm. to begin with Originally. and then taken over by the Romans. The deities change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you can't worship the same one that the Nabataeans But they did worshiped. align. They had but these, they did they align. Believed they had the exactly. Same <laughs> and right. so there are these complex sort of, of I was going to say God plays. I mean, mm -hmm. they're deity realignments. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you take advantage of what was there. You keep the loyalty of the mm -hmm. people who are living right. there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're introducing new ones, new mm -hmm. traditions, new religious traditions. Mm -hmm. And so in the process, this is dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, this is extremely dynamic time mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. OK, now the great temple. Right. Larry, you know very well the people who excavated this mm -hmm. temple. Mm -hmm. Uh, Martha Joukowsky, who's written a book on uh, archaeological technique and has uh, established a, quite a, a large uh, archaeological institute at Brown University where she's taught, 
uh, was the one who's worked there for a decade uh, excavating this, this great temple and restoring it, which is beautifully done, so that a visitor can see sort of what it was like back mm -hmm. originally. So that one could walk up from the Cardo, here mm -hmm. it is, and here's the Triumphal Arch, one could walk up these monumental stairs mm -hmm. to this uh, temenos, uh, this open area, and then up into the temple proper. This one's a bit u unusual. Very. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. what, what is in the back a little, of that? A it's little this, theater. At the a back. little theater <laughs> in the People back. People speculate about the function. <laughs> right, right, right. It's and large too. 130 feet. Uh, the the temple itself. It is. It about is. 130 feet. And we think this uh, represents at least the front part of that temple. And we're not sure that the other part is on it. But these columns, the monumental stairs typical of, uh, of Roman theater, uh, of Roman... Uh, and as you said, the, the colors, which we probably wouldn't have done mm -hmm. because we love uh, the stone. natural color yeah. of the yeah. stone, yeah. Yeah. but they plastered it over and painted it, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. And Kent, even if traces this? exist, it right. would right. the pigments. Right. right, right. What is this, Kent? So, <laughs> sit yeah. laying on its back. Yeah, we should, we should sit before. <laughs> right. uh, we, we all know capitals at the top of the, the columns. You know, the Corinthian, right. the Manic, the Doric columns. This would be the top, yeah. Right, but this is an elephant capital. Um, very unique, right. and indicating, I think, the, uh, the sort of the international connections that Petra right. had. Right. Of course, elephants used to be uh, up in the Syria, but and lots of them. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten how many twenty some, I think, mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. uh, from the capitals. Mm -hmm. And then this picture showing the the great temple off to the right, and then uh, what's being excavated by Leanne Badal in Pennsylvania. Um, the um, garden complex and mm -hmm. pool called a paradisius, mm -hmm. a, a paradise. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the pool was here. You can kind of see where, where these are reversed views here. We're looking at it from the front and from the back here. The garden area was out here. They've excavated. They know what kinds of plants showed mm -hmm. up in mm -hmm. this uh, um, paradise mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this garden. So mm -hmm. spectacular. I mean, and water, water everywhere. This is a display of power. It is uh, in the uh, desert, right? Yeah, it really was. Well, we can conclude by looking at some artifacts here. We only have a minute, but mm -hmm. um, what do we have here? These are all Roman. Um, maybe pick one of those, uh, Kent, and tell well, us. I always like the uh, the cooking pots. You're stuck on the cooking. Yeah, you know, there's something about um, <laughs> food. You know. Right. I'm sure right. the Romans could identify with with this, but imagine the Roman family cooking a, a meal, yeah. a stew, in a pot like this. Mm -hmm. We have, of course, and jugs then, and juglets and lamps. We've got some lamps and unguentaria mm -hmm. and perfumes. some Roman glass mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Kent and Larry, and all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. Uh, we hope that the program has provided some enlightenment for the mind and some food for the soul, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.